If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab it and turn to Matthew chapter 2, where we're going to be looking at the story of the wise men meeting Jesus. Now, uh, how many of you have heard this story before? Yeah, a lot of you. How many of you saw this story this week? playing out somewhere in coffee tables and yards around you. Okay, so most of the hands in the room just went up between those two questions. So let's see how well we know the story before we dive in. I thought this would be fun. We'll do a little quick Christmas quiz. Um, How many wise men were there? Three. Yeah, see, some of you are like, this feels like a trick. Okay, so actually most people think there are three because there were three gifts. Um, But the text doesn't tell us. We don't actually know. There could have been a fourth who is cheap, and he just signed his name to the card and said, actually, Jesus, that myrrh, that's that's from both of us. Um, And actually, in fact, given the amount of distance they travel, um, some commentators think it's very likely that there is a a group much larger than three. But really, we don't ultimately know. Um, Question number two, who got there first, the wise men or the shepherds? Shepherds, very good. Uh, We'll we'll see this actually on Christmas Eve. The shepherds were there uh, the night of the first Noel. They see baby Jesus lying in a manger. Um, But the wise men, they get there later. In fact, most commentators believe it's much later that based on the events of at the end of Matthew chapter 2, most believe that Jesus is probably two years old by the time these guys show up. And so um, what that means is um, your, your nativity seems completely theologically inaccurate. And so here, here's just a fun Christmas tradition I'll give to you. Uh, you can go home, take your wise men out of the manger scene and move them to the far end of your house. And then on Christmas night, just start moving them one day after another closer and closer and closer to the manger scene to where on New Year's Day or whenever you pack up all your Christmas gear, they finally make it. And then you can have Christmas 2.0. It'll be a great time. Great tradition for you. You'll teach great theology to everyone that visits your home. Um, But yeah, the shepherds got there first. The wise men don't come till much later. Okay, last question. Where were the wise men coming from? Now, this one's not a trick question, and I, I, I hear some answers over here. I hear East, Orient, someone's singing the song, we three kings of Orient are, which is useful in telling you where they come from that they are from the east, probably the land of Babylon, which is the last place we see wise men uh, in the Bible before this. Um, But while that song's helpful in telling us where they came from, um, the the title of that song, sorry to ruin another Christmas song for you, the title of that song is completely inaccurate. These guys aren't kings. And in fact, the whole point of the story in Matthew is they're not kings, but they're looking for a king. And in Jesus, they find the king they're looking for. And so this is the aspect of the Christmas story. Some of you are like, another Christmas song, Pastor? I promise that's the last Christmas song I'll ruin for you this year. Uh, But this is the aspect of the Christmas story we're going to be looking at. Uh, We've looked at how this child is God. We've looked at how this child is man. We've looked at how this child is Savior. And today we're going to be looking at what does it mean when we sing all of these songs about how this child is the king. Uh, Are you ready? All right. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we read this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Everyone say troubled. He was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's written in the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and he ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring word to me that I may come to and worship him. Spoiler alert, Herod's a liar. Verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way, 
and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Everybody say joy. Joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, because he's a liar, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, we're going to look at this story in three parts this morning. Merry Christmas, note takers, I'm going to give you the outline. We're going to look at uh, the search, we're going to look at the disturbance, and then we're going to look at the worship. And so we'll start with uh, the search. Um, Matthew tells us that there are these wise men who come to Jerusalem searching for a king. Uh, Now, the word in the original language doesn't say wise men. It's not two words. It's one word. It's the word magi. It's the word from which we get our word magic. Um, Because what these guys would do is they would look up at the stars and try to discern truth about ultimate reality. They would listen to dreams and try to interpret these things um, and, and to really to give guidance to kings and leaders in high places based on what's going on up there. They would try to um, give wisdom for how to do life here on earth. Now, because that sounds like voodoo, um, most Bible translators or a lot of Bible translators are like, what if we just called them wise men? Because that's the function they're doing. They're giving guidance to the kings. But I want you to know who these guys are so that you'll appreciate their search. Um, Culturally speaking, these guys had it all. They were held in high regard in the palaces. The kings would look to them in guidance. They'd say, hey, what's going on up in the stars? What policy should I be pursuing? What, What should we do about this over here? Again, the book of Daniel, you can read this is a common thing that happened in the ancient world. These guys were held in high regard in the palace. They rubbed shoulders with the kings. Uh, Man, if they had Twitter back then, they would have had blue check marks before you could buy one. These guys were considered to be among the elites. Culturally speaking, they had it all. And yet, what we see in this story is they come to Jerusalem searching because they saw something in the sky that told them that something incredible has happened. That a king, unlike all of these other kings that they have worked with and served with, that a king, unlike all of them, has been born. A king so good that he would be worthy of this long journey and gifts and worship. And so they see something in the sky, and they set off on the search for a good king that's greater than the kings that they know back in Babylon. And and what I would submit to you is that you and I uh, live our life on the same search. Now, um, I'm fully aware that the whole point of being American is we don't need a king. Like, we fought a whole war over this, right? So some of you are like, hey, back up. I'm not looking for a king. But then I would just simply ask you this. um, Why are we so obsessed with Meghan and Harry? Right? Like, why was the Queen's funeral one of the most watched television events in history? Um, What I would submit to you is that deep down in every human heart exists the longing for a good king that we can give ourselves to, that we can give our allegiance to, who we believe will lead us in the right way and protect us from evil. This is why we get so worked up every four years when we vote on our king. I I mean president. Because we have all of this hope that we build up into this person, that if we can just get the right person in power and in control, then our lives will be okay. It's the same search. The wise men set off on the same search that you and I are on. They're looking for a good king who, unlike all of the other kings they've ever seen, is truly worthy of their worship and allegiance and praise. And look, maybe... Maybe you've given up hope that such a king exists. But what I want you to see is these wise men, after all the shady stuff they've seen in the palaces of Babylon, they see something in the sky that tells them, keep searching, it's out there. And so they head out to Jerusalem looking for a truly good king that they believe has been born. 
And, and when they get to the city, uh, they head to the palace and, and they get into the palace and they get an audience with the king because, you know, they're uh, people that roll in those circles. They come to the palace and they say, hey, where's this new king that's been born? Which is a pretty gutsy thing to do because, like I said, there's already a king in Jerusalem at this time, a man named Herod. And Herod, uh, he wasn't born king. They ask about the one who has been born king of the Jews. Herod wasn't born king of the Jews. He was made king by the Romans. Um, because, particularly because of his brutality. See, see, the region around Jerusalem, because of all the religious fervor, this will be hard for you to relate to today. But at this time, this part of the world, there was a lot of tension that would often lead to violence. Some of you didn't get that. Okay. Um, and, and, and so what the Romans uh, did is they wanted to put the most um, violent king they could in place to say, this place is going to blow up if someone does not keep a tight lid on it. And so they saw in Herod someone that was ruthless enough to do whatever it takes to keep this part of the world under control. And, and for a time, he did it. Um, Herod brought peace to the region that his predecessors and those after him failed to, um, really because anyone that would even mildly step out of line, he'd kill him. Uh, John the Baptist gets beheaded by this guy. He, he, he does not suffer fools. If he sees that this could lead to rebellion, this could be a problem, he'd just kill people. Um, Herod's actually quite famous outside of the Bible for um, killing his wife and his two sons because he thought they were a threat to his rule. Um, Caesar Augustus, who's really his boss, he had this to say about our boy Herod. He said, it is safer to be Herod's pig than his son. And so here come these wise men doing something that doesn't sound very wise to me. They come before Herod and they're like, hey buddy, where's the new king? You, you know, the one that's been born king of the Jews. So, oh, you know what? That would mean he has a more legitimate claim to the throne than you do. Matthew tells us Herod is troubled by this. Um, that word troubled is translated elsewhere as uh, terrified, which I think is a much more accurate translation for what's going on here, since if you read the end of Matthew chapter 2, what you'll see is Herod, true to form, he slaughters all of the little boys in the town of Bethlehem, aged two and under, to just eliminate any threat to his rule. This man is terrified. When he hears a king has come, he doesn't want to sing a Christmas song about it. He is terrified at the announcement of this king. And this leads to the second thing I said we talk about, the disturbance. Um, on the one hand, the announcement that a good king has come is great news if you're searching for a king. But what I think has happened a lot of times for a lot of us, is that we have been disappointed so many times by the kings and queens and rulers and authority figures that we've looked to in our lives, that we've stopped looking for that good king, and we've started to look to ourselves as our own self-sovereign. Um, the philosophers call this expressive individualism. If you need a big fancy term this morning, expressive individualism. Um, the idea behind this, you may have never have heard the term, but I'm sure you're familiar with the idea. The idea is essentially that each one of us has our own truth. Each one of us has our own path that we need to follow. And the way to happiness to, under this philosophy is to throw off anyone that would try to be an authority figure in your life. Anyone that would try to tell you right from wrong, whether that's God, whether that's your family, whether that's your friends, whether that's society, even things like science. If science disagrees with your truth, then you throw it off because freedom is not found by being, uh, having authority figures in your life. It's found by casting those aside and living your truth and living your path to fulfillment. This is every Disney movie that's been made in the last 15 years, except maybe Encanto. Um, I'll give you just one example, because we watch a lot of Disney movies, so I like to think of myself as a connoisseur of sorts. Um, has anybody seen the movie Frozen? Yeah. Wow, almost as many as Know the Wise Men. Way to go, Disney. 
Uh, we have three girls in our home, so I've seen this movie more times than I can count. And so this is just the first thing I think of when I think expressive individualism. It's not the only example, but I think it's a good one, and it's obviously a popular one. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, the main character is uh, a young woman named Elsa. And uh, she is born with these magical powers. And she's also born to be the future queen. And so what her parents tell you is, hey, don't let people know you have these magical powers. You're going to freak them out. And so um, what Elsa does as a young girl, she just shuts everybody out. Now, they never tell her to go this extreme, but this is what her as a little girl does. She shuts everybody out, and one day, she just utterly snaps. She loses it. Her magic goes out of control, freezes the entire kingdom, darkness everywhere. And, and here's the song she sings at this moment. Some of you will be familiar with this song. I'll just read you some of the lyrics. It says, the wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Well, now they know. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. I can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. Let it go. Turn away and slam the door because I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. Sorry, that's the three girls in me. I've seen it 10,000 times. Anyone else with me on that one? Um, it's a catchy song. It's a cute movie. It's also a tragic song. Because what she's saying here is she's saying, I'm done being the person that my parents told me I should be. I'm done being who my community needs me to be. I'm going to throw all of that off, and I'm going to live my truth up in my little self-made ice castle with nobody but this monster I created. And it's a really sad point in the movie. And the whole movie is really built to resolve the madness of this song. And look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's no such thing as overbearing families that put too much pressure on you that you might need to get a little space and perspective away from. Surely there's some wisdom in that. What I'm saying is if you go to the opposite extreme and you say, I'm going to throw off what everyone would tell me. I am going to shut them out, slam the door, and I will be my only authority. I will be the one that I listen to, and I will live my truth, and I don't care what they're going to say, then you're no different than Herod. You're trying to be your own self-sovereign, and if that's where you're at, Christmas is going to disturb you just like the first Christmas disturbed Herod. And you might think, what kind of monster is disturbed by Christmas? Um, well, actually, I, I would submit to you, I think this is why Christianity has largely gone out of style in recent years. Um, because we live in a culture that's built on let it go. We live in a culture that says, who knows how to run your life better than you? And so when Christmas comes in with this announcement that actually there's a king who has come into the world who has a more rightful claim to the throne of your heart, who knows better than you know what you need that will lead to flourishing and freedom and fullness of life will not be found in casting him aside, but actually freedom and fullness of life will be found in bending the knee to him. Man, our culture is a lot like Herod where, where we hear that and we go, no thanks, that's a threat to my expression, that's a threat to my truth. And, and it's really easy, I think, to think about other people going like, oh, that's so true for them. Like, I, I need to send them this sermon. I hope he's listening right now. Um, but let's just have some real talk. If we live in this culture where this is just the air we breathe, then I think we're crazy to think that this doesn't affect us too. And so let me just ask you for a minute about your life to think about your life. Um, who called the shots in your life this last week? Who set your priorities 
this past week? Um, Who in your life has the authority to tell you no and you listen? Is it Jesus? Is it someone else? Is it your own desires? Because the way you answer that question, that is the true king of your life. Regardless of what you write on your statement of faith, the one that sets your priorities, the one that has the authority to tell you no and to tell you yes, like that's the real king of your life. And I think if we're really honest, I think most of us are more like Herod than we would like to admit. Where we're all cool with Jesus when he's saving us like we talked about last week. Like, thanks for that, Jesus. I couldn't have done that. I'm so appreciative that you saved me. But the second Jesus starts acting like a king and making claims on our life and making claims on our time, on our money, on our bodies, that's when we feel disturbed. And look right at me. The disturbance in here always leads to disturbance out there. And you might not commit genocide like Herod did because of this disturbance, but I can promise you this. The disturbance in here is leading to disturbances out there with your friends, with your family. Uh, I think if you could be honest enough, it's probably led to disturbances that have disappointed yourself and hurt yourself. Because here's the thing. You're only human. You were never meant to bear the pressure of being your own self-sovereign. And what Christmas is, is it's the announcement that the good king that you were made for, the king that you have been longing for your whole life has come. And when you can receive that, it leads to a very different type of response than we see in Herod. Uh, And that leads to the third thing I want to talk about, the worship. Um. Herod's team of Bible scholars point these guys, uh, the wise men, that is, in the direction of Bethlehem, which there's a whole lot to unpack just in that whole uh, scenario, but I've got to save something for next Christmas, all right? So come back for that one. Uh, Long story short, they point these guys in the right right directions because they had their Bibles open, and they, off they go to Bethlehem. And when the wise men get to Bethlehem, um, the, the star that they were following, it stops moving. And, and I know this sounds like voodoo to you. I was thinking about it this week. I'm like, this is crazy. When the star stops moving, they knew how to read that. For, for them, this is no different than Google Maps telling you, you have arrived at your destination. Some of you are like, I think I have that spiritual gift. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I don't. So, so uh, the star tells them, you have arrived at your destination. And so in they go to the house. And when they see Jesus, Matthew tells us this. He tells us their emotional state. He told us Herod's, disturbed. Now he's going to tell us the wise men. He says, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now some of you are like, that's redundant. That's bad grammar. Uh, Yeah, that's the point. What Matthew is telling us is these guys flipped out. They were full of joy. They lost their minds. It's going to require bad grammar to like get at the fullness of what's going on here. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Do you ever have a Christmas morning like this? Any of you ever get that Red Ryder BB gun that you've been hoping for, but everyone told you, no, it's not going to happen. You're going to shoot your eye out. Have you ever had the Christmas morning where You you get it. You finally get it. And you're like, this is amazing. This is the best day ever. Anyone have that Christmas? Yeah. That's what's going on here. These guys are rejoicing exceedingly with great joy because the king they have longed for their whole life, the good king that they've longed for, they're looking at him. They say, this is incredible. And so they do the only thing that makes sense. They bow down and they worship him. Um, I don't know what comes into your mind when you hear that word worship. Uh, Maybe you think about uh, singing. And and, and surely singing is a way that we can and we do worship. Uh, But according to the Bible, 
the possibilities are endless for how we worship. We are created to worship, and so we worship with everything we got, with our mouth, with our hands, with, with our singing in church, but it goes beyond that. Jesus talks a lot about how we worship with our finances and where we invest that. We worship with our time and how we invest that. We worship with our body and what we do with that. Like These are all ways that we express what is worthy to us. That's what the word worship means. It literally means to express worth. Possibilities for worship are endless, but at the heart of worship, it's doing what we see the wise men doing here. Bowing down to the king. And look, I I don't know about you, I'll just speak for me. Um, I've seen so many nativity scenes that I'm so familiar with this scene that the ridiculousness of this is almost lost on me. And so let me just point out a couple of obvious things going on in the text, all right? Um, Jesus is about two years old, maybe younger, um, but about two. Any of you ever see a two-year-old? Now, I loved this stage with our girls. It is so much fun being around two-year-olds, but I'll be straight with you. I never had the thought that I should bow down to this human. I had the thought I should change her diaper, I had the thought she'll grow out of that. That's adorable. That's cute. I never had the thought that I should get lower than them because they are greater than I am. And that's what you're doing when you're bowing. In bowing, what you are doing is you are humbling yourself and you are recognizing, you are getting low and saying that you are greater than me. And so what you have here are these cultural elites, these men that are held in high esteem in high places. They walk into a house with a family that couldn't even get a room in the inn a few years ago. And they come before two-year-old Jesus and they bow on the ground before him. What they are saying in this moment is you're the one we've been waiting for our whole lives. You are are the king we have been looking for. You are not just a king, you are my king. I'm going to get my life low before you and declare that you're greater, that you're the king, and I'm just happy to be your subject. I'm just happy to know you and get to see you and get to worship you. I give my life to you, everything. It's yours. This is what the wise men are doing. This is at the heart of worship, and I would submit to you, this is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian isn't just somebody that has some ideas about God in your head. Uh, The New Testament will tell us Satan has better theology than you, except the theology scares the hell out of him. It it, it doesn't mean just that you know right ideas in your head about God, and and even that you go to church. It doesn't mean simply that you prayed a prayer one time. Like, all of these things can be a part of our Christian experience, but you can't boil the Christian life down to that when the Bible never does. According to the Bible, what it means to be a Christian is to be someone who is convinced that in the person of Jesus Christ, we have found the good king that we've been looking for, and to joyfully bow our lives before him and say, you have the throne of my life. My body, my money, my time, everything, it's yours. You tell me where to go. You're my king. This is the essence of what it means to be a Christian according to the New Testament. And and I know that's a higher bar than what we sometimes think of. And I know that that could, at first thought, disturb you when you hear it. I think it's why people are leaving the churches in droves, because they're hearing what the book said all along. They're finally hearing it. And we're in a cultural setting where that's just offensive. That doesn't sound good. But something in these wise men, they hear it, they offer, and they're like, yes, I'm all in. And what I hope you see in this story is when you do bow before King Jesus, you will experience the type of joy in life that in contrast to Herod, no expressive individualist will ever experience. Because in bowing the knee to King Jesus, you are bringing your life into orbit around the one for whom you were made. And that's where life really gets interesting. So the question is, how do you know it's true? 
We've got two responses in our text. We've got Herod and the wise men. How do we know that what the wise men saw was real? How do we know that that joy was real, that that lasted? How can we experience what they experience when we live in a Herod-like world? How can we, how can we know that Jesus is worthy of bowing down to? And, and to answer that, I would say you, you've just got to look at the contrast Matthew's been giving us between Herod and Jesus. Um, because history knows Herod, um, uh, the title he's known by is Herod the Great. Herod was considered one of the greatest rulers at this point in history because he got Jerusalem in line. He was very impressive. Like, historians will regard his poor character, they'll write that down, but they'll also talk about his great achievements. So when Matthew's writing his gospel, everyone's like, oh, Herod's the man. He is a big deal. He is a great king. And what Matthew has been showing us all chapter along is that Jesus is greater than even the greatest kings of this earth. And and you see that contrast uh, most clearly in the gifts that the wise men bring to Jesus. Uh, In Matthew uh, 2, verse 12, uh, we read that the wise men bring him um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, Now, why those gifts? I mean, it doesn't sound very baby-friendly, right? Could have been a rattle, something to shake. Like, babies love that, right? There could have been a toy that was so fun for that baby and obnoxious for Mary and Joseph that they'd find a way to pull the batteries out and go, oh, I don't know what happened. Like, why these gifts? Well, each of these gifts had a very specific uh, significance in the ancient world. Um, Gold was known as the metal for royalty. And so by bringing him gold, what they're saying is you are the king. Maybe no one else in Bethlehem gets it. Maybe they think you're unimpressive and there's no room in the inn for you, but we recognize that you are a king, that you are royalty, and you are worthy of gold. And so that's what they're saying with the gold. Um, Frankincense, this is really interesting, it's a spice they used in worship. And so what they're saying with the frankincense is you're not only a king like Herod, you're the good king. You're the one that we've been longing for. You're a king that's worthy of worship. Like every king's going to tax you and take your gold, but not every king gets your heart and your frankincense and your worship. You with me? What they're saying is you're, you're not only a king, you're the one that we've been looking for. You're worthy of our worship. And the third thing they bring them is myrrh, which is by far the weirdest thing on this list. Um, Because myrrh was used in the ancient world for embalming. You would cover those who were dead in it to cover up the the smell. This is something you did as part of burial practices. I can only imagine Mary being like, uh, not sure we want him to have that one. But these wise men, They saw something in the sky to know. We don't know to what degree, but to some degree what they're saying is we understand that this child is going to die. And this is where you really see the contrast between Jesus and Herod because uh, Herod would be known for making peace by killing his enemies. Jesus would be known for making peace with rebels by the blood of his own cross. Um, Herod was known for his violence and for killing others in order to be able to stay on his throne. Jesus would be known for giving up his throne. Uh, Herod would cause thousands to die for him. Jesus would come from heaven and give his life and die for us, for the world, because he loves us. And and, and so that's why we worship him. That's why we can say, yeah, he is worthy of bowing down to because unlike all the kings and rulers and humans of this world, he is the king who uses his power not to crush us, not to use us in some cog in his machine to make him look better, but he is the good king who lays his life down to lift us up and to free us and to lead us into the life that we were made for. He's the good king that we've been longing for. And so look, as we begin our week-long response to this message, um, I just want to ask you to bow your heads 
for, for just a moment here. And don't worry, nothing weird is going to happen. No one's going to take your bag. Um, if, if they do, we've got security in the back. We got your back. Um, but go ahead and just bow your heads for a moment. Um, I want to give you some space to respond to Jesus before we rush out of here. Because we live in a Herod-like world, I think the default mode of our hearts, even for Christians, is to drift that way. And so I just want to give us some time here to really respond before we run out of here. And so um, with your head bowed, um, I wonder if there's anyone in the room this morning who would say, I want to bow my knee to King Jesus this morning for the first time. If he'll love me like that, I am in. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I can't see those that are watching online. I can't see through the camera. I don't know what all is going on, but I'll I'll just say this. If that's you, if you raised your hand, would you just, you can pray like this. The words aren't magical. I just want to give you some space to respond to Jesus. You could say this, Jesus, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for coming to give your life for me. You're the one I've been looking for. I didn't even know it. And so this morning, I give my life to you. Would you send your spirit to live in me and to lead me and guide me? I want you to be my king. Thank you. Amen. Um, If you prayed that prayer, I I would just ask you to fill out a connect card before you leave. um, Or you can do that digitally online. Um, We really believe that that prayer, that is the first step and a very great adventure with Jesus. And it's an adventure we're meant to do together. And so if you're thinking, man, I don't want everyone to see me, you can drop it anonymously in the offering boxes in the back on your way out. You can fill it out online. But we would love to support you in your walk with Jesus and living with the good king. Um, With that said, uh, with every head bowed still, I want to also ask this. I want to give you some space. And so let me just ask you this. How many of you walked in here this morning as Christians, and yet as you're listening this morning, the Holy Spirit's prompting you where you realize you have an area of your life that you need to bow to King Jesus? How many of you are like, gosh, I'd love to rejoice exceedingly with great joy like the wise men, but that's not where I'm at. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? Um, You don't need to be shy. Look, we all experience drift in our walk with Jesus. To be a Christian does not mean that you will do this perfectly. That's the whole point of the cross, that you're covered, that you're clean, no matter what you could confess to him this morning. And so in light of that, I want to leave you with the question, where do you need to come to him and bow this morning and say, Jesus, I want you to be the king of my life again. I give you this area of my life. Thank you for buying me with the price. I now give back to you the life that you have purchased with your own blood. I don't know what it is for you, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking and revealing that to you right now. And so what I want to do is I just want to pray for you and give you some time to respond to Jesus uh, in prayer. Uh, You'll have an opportunity to respond to Jesus through singing, through the giving of our offerings, uh, using offering boxes on the way out or online, if that's how you like to do that. Whatever it looks like for you, um, I want to encourage you, don't leave here this morning without responding to Jesus, because this is where the joy is at. You can rejoice exceedingly with great joy, because the King has come. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for being you. You are what our hearts long for. Um, Thank you for the gift of Christmas. Thank you for giving us something to sing about and to celebrate. Um, Jesus, I ask that in your love for us that you would just send your Holy Spirit in this moment to reveal our hearts to us. You know the things about us that we don't even know about ourselves. And so wherever there's areas of our life that we need to bow the knee to you, wherever you have more joy, more life for us that we've been resisting, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would reveal that to us this morning. 
and that by the power of our, your spirit, you would get our eyes up so that we could see you like the wise men and rejoice exceedingly with great joy at the thought of having you as our king. God, I pray against the hardness of heart. I pray against hardness of heart in this room. Would you soften our hearts? Would you restore the joy of the salvation to so many of my brothers and sisters who might be feeling dry right now? Would you do your best work in this place and give us this great Christmas gift out of your great love for us? We love you. We need you. And so in your beautiful name, we pray and ask all of these things.